So there's a referendum coming up later in June um, to decide whether or not the UK wants to remain a member of the European Union. Primarily not a science issue. I mean, it's a huge societal issue, but in as much as science is part of society, it is actually a science issue as well. And there are kind of specific things that the EU does extremely well for science that we would really miss if we were not in it anymore. Yeah, I guess you'd call me a Remain person, but I think overall the EU is a good thing. So I think the third thing to say is the EU is not perfect, far from it. And, you know, there are things about it which really annoy me. Things like the fact that, you know, we've got this ridiculous thing of the European Parliament moving around from one place to another just to keep everyone politically appeased. So th there are lots of things where there really is a need for reform and the EU is very bad at reforming itself partly because it's just so big it's very hard for it to change. But there are also very good things that it does. The trouble is as soon as you, as a scientist, as soon as you start arguing in favour of the European Union and how it's good for science, it's like, well, of course you'd say that because you're getting lots of funding from the European Union. Personally, I'm not actually, I don't have any direct European Union funding for the science that I do. But actually it's also missing the point because the amount of money that comes into British science from the European Union is relatively modest. In universities, it's funding somewhere between about five and 10% of research. Plus, you know, there's a perfectly reasonable argument that says if we leave the European Union, there may be some extra money and maybe some of that money will go into science anyway. So maybe we'd end up in more or less the same per place, at least in terms of ab absolute funding. The bigger issue is all the stuff that goes along with the funding. And it's the structures, the fact that the European Union makes it very easy for us to exchange ideas, for us to share staff from one place to another, share resources, get together to discuss ideas. So it's a way that enables collaborations to be made in a very straightforward way. Now you can always make collaborations, I have many collaborations that have nothing at all to do with the European Union, but the thing is when you start making big collaborations, you know, you have to have rules for them, you have to have regulations, you need a memorandum of understanding and you know, lots of paperwork and everyone needs to sign up to it and it can be a huge bureaucracy and you don't want to be going through that every time you want to set up some new collaboration. What the European Union does is kind of has that framework in place, which means that when you've got a new idea, it's relatively straightforward to slot things in, to get people together, to set these ideas up, to set things in motion, without having to go through every time this rigmarole of, well, we better all sign this paperwork and here's the legal agreement and all that, because that side's all done. And so it means we're very much more effective than we would be if we were having to go through that negotiation every time we wanted to come up with some new collaboration. By extension, are you saying to me that you have fewer or inferior collaborations with Americans or Australians because they're not in the European Union? Like, are, are those other relationships suffering? I don't think so. I just well, then, you, then your whole argument falls apart. No, because actually you just get extra value, right? I mean, I'm quite happy to set up those collaborations where they're the right thing to do, but... Oh, I, right, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's Someone up. doesn't like the European Union, yeah. <laughs> And you know, there are many collaborations, even within Europe, the there are collaborations we're involved in that are nothing to do with the European Union. So for example, the European Southern Observatory, very successful astronomical collaboration, so nothing to do with the European Union. There are countries in it which are EU members, there are countries in it which aren't. And it works extremely well. It's a big intergovernmental agreement. Obviously, again, there's a huge kind of uh, hurdle to set that kind of thing up, but now it is set up. Yes, it'll continue to succeed. It doesn't need the European Union. You, you're willing to say that you have better relationships with European scientists as a result of being in the EU, but you're unwilling to say that your relationships with people outside the EU suffer in any way. I don't, no, I don't think that. I think there's, a, there's a, a, a false element to that argument. That's kind of like saying, you know, we could actually have perfectly successful collaborations without email. We could just send faxes to each other. And it would work, uh, and we would continue to do science, but it, would, you know, it wouldn't work as effectively because we don't have such effective infrastructure for doing the work we want to do. And so really it's the EU is providing that infrastructure that adds extra value. It's not taking away anybody else's value, it's just adding extra value to the, the EU collaborations. But you're unwilling to say your relationship with American scientists is inferior. You're, you're unwilling to say, oh, the fact we have to still fax the Americans does slow down our science, I have to admit. No, I'm happy to say that. It's harder work. It really is. It's harder work to have to go through. And it really is mostly in those initial stages when you're first setting up, especially if it's a big collaboration. It's those initial stages where you need to suddenly get everybody to sign up, kind of starting from scratch. Whereas setting up an EU network, all, most of the rules are already there, most of the, the agreements are already in place, and it's just a question of slotting in the particular piece of science you want to do. And in particular, science is becoming a bigger and bigger business, right? That actually a lot of the things we do need large collaborations of groups of people, 
and you really need to kind of bring in the best skills from wherever you can get them. That's very hard to do, as just sort of setting things up from scratch every time. It's a lot easier to do it within this context of saying, here's a brilliant idea, there's somebody in Germany who does it, there's somebody in Italy who does it, there's somebody in Poland who does it, there's somebody in the UK who brings another skill set to it. And being able to combine those skills together is just a vital thing to be doing for a lot of the science that gets done nowadays. I can imagine an outsider saying, a slight reduction in paperwork for scientists seems like the flimsiest of flimsy arguments. I mean, firstly, I agree with you, right? I don't think this should be the reason either to remain or to leave on its own, because there are many more fundamental, basic reasons, that things that we should be thinking about in terms of economics and immigration and all the other things that people are currently arguing about. It's just one aspect of things. But it's not really just a question of filling in a few more forms, right? It's things that just wouldn't happen without that structure there. Let me give you an example. So I'm involved in the European Extremely Large Telescope Project, this enormous telescope um, that's getting built. It's being built by the European Southern Observatory. So, you know, when you look at it on the surface, you say, yeah, well, so it's nothing to do with the European Union. Why are we wasting our time with the European Union? Turns out the UK has a very big role in the, in the project and has been, you know, leading quite a lot of the science case and is actually building one of the in first instruments that's going to go on the back of the telescope and so on. And when you trace it back, you say, why is the UK so well placed? It's because 10, 15 years ago, when we were first thinking about this project, we did quite a lot of work in terms of writing the science case for it, thinking about what the instrumentation should be and all those kinds of things, which was actually done as a, an EU network. So the subset of members of the European Southern Observatory who were actually, you know, are part of the EU, were involved in these very early discussions and really got a massive head start because we were able to do things that way. And so in that sense, it's kind of catalyzed things that the EU is not funding this project, but the fact that we were part of the EU has meant that we have a really good kind of foot in the door in this project because we were able to do that early work in that very straightforward way, which we wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't been part of the EU. I don't know, I feel like the argument would be made, we'd be there anyway, like, and we will continue to be there if we're good enough, and you don't need to be part of this club. I mean, it just helps, right? It, I agree, you know, and the trouble is you can never do the controlled experiment, right? You can never say, okay, so here's a UK which is in the EU, EU and here's one that isn't, let's see how their science gets on. Right? It's just I know from, from experience that actually a lot of the things where we've been very successful, if you dig back into them, you can say, oh yeah, actually the EU kind of played a fairly critical little role somewhere in there. And as I say, because it's, you know, it's only funding 5-10% of UK science, it's clearly not driving the whole thing forward. But actually I think we get exceptionally good value for money out of that relatively small contribution because it just enables so many other things to happen. Again, one of the big issues in science now is everything is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more expensive. And that's why you have things like the European Southern Observatory, why you have CERN for doing particle physics and so on. We have to get together to do these things. One of the, the things that scientists need f forever on bigger and bigger scales is high performance computing. We need these big supercomputers and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where individual countries can't afford to run them just for their own benefit. And we're part of a thing called PRACE, which again is a part of the, the European Union, which allows us to then use the top high performance computers in Europe, which happen not to be in the UK, they happen to be in places like Germany and Spain, we get to use their computers um, in a very kind of transparent, easy to use way. Again, we could probably set up bilateral agreements with these people, or if we left the EU, we could buy into this price thing, because I think our various other non-EU countries like Israel are part of it. So there are ways of doing it, it just gets harder and harder, and each time, you know, it's, if it's harder to do, it costs money, sooner or later people are gonna say, no, we're not gonna do that. Whereas having it all there just makes it just, just that much more straightforward and likely to happen. Talk to me about what you think science in the UK will be like if UK does pull out and leaves the EU. We'll kind of cut ourselves off from one of the most vibrant scientific communities available to us. Not the only one, but one of them. And even if we buy back in again, which again is something that people argue, oh, well, you know, you could stay part of this, you know, Horizon 2020, these frameworks that the EU has we're kind of then on the periphery of it. So we probably won't be the people who are actually driving that scientific agenda forward of saying, well, what should we be doing beyond 2020? What's the next thing that the EU should be funding in science? We're not going to be the people who have any real say in that discussion. You're more of a customer than a boss. Yeah, we really are. We're just kind of, you know, living off the scraps because we just take whatever we're given and say, oh, well, thank you very much. But anyway, you're not even giving it, right? You're still paying for it. Um, and again, it's another cost that actually, you know, we talk about all these savings coming back, but actually if you're going to use the money to buy back into all these things, you end up back where you started. You've lost that position kind of at the head of the table of actually being one of the real people who are driving the agenda forward. And we get great value for money by being in that position, by having that respect around that table, we actually get to then have a disproportionate say in how the entire European Union science programme goes, not just the UK science programme. 
So we would lose all that and we would just be kind of become much more clients, much more just people taking what's available to us rather than the people who are actually setting the agenda for European science. Do you know any British scientists who want out? There are some. There's a, a what's it called, uh, Scientists for Britain or something, um, which was set up in competition against, you know, Scientists for EU was the, the uh, contrary voice. So there have been various sort of polls done as to what the split is, and it's something like 90% of scientists in the UK want to remain in the EU and about 10% want to leave. The case is basically, is, as far as I can gather, is largely, it's, it's you know, s uh, setting up all these alternatives to the EU, that we have these collaborations across the world, that there are these other intergovernmental agreements. There's this argument that says that actually even if we're not in the EU, we can buy back into this um, Horizon 2020 and stay involved with it. And then there's the economic one that says that, you know, that the UK is a net contributor to the EU, so therefore clearly if we left entirely, we could fund all the things that we're currently getting back from the EU money for and more as well. And that last one, I think, you know, is fundamentally at some level is sort of true. It's hard, to, again, to go through what exactly the process, what would actually happen if we left the EU in terms of what it would do to the economy. But you can do that very simple sum that says, you know, we're one of the wealthier countries in the EU, therefore we contribute more than we get back. That's probably the right thing. That's the way the organisation should work. Um, and if we left, you know, we wouldn't be paying in anymore. So therefore, anything that we're currently getting money back for, we could just do anyway. The counter argument really is, is that as I've kind of stressed, I think throughout this, it's not really the money, it's the processes, it's the, the arrangements, the networks, the formulae, that they're all there in place, that there isn't actually a cash value for, but in some sense, they're almost invaluable. And that's what we would really lose if we left. The problem comes that if we leave the European Union, British scientists will no longer be involved with the distribution of money from the European Union.